Here is a live pitcher plant. Here is one of its pitchers. You can see the little lid over it. There's the slip zone there, and inside is the water. It appears to be a well-designed object, a well-designed pot. If we were to do our cost-benefit ratio, our measure of the amount of water that it holds over the uh, weight of the plant material itself, we'd find that it was a very efficient pot indeed. But we'd also find that if we uh, looked inside, cut sections of it, it would have a very complicated structure. This is the inside of a single cell of a pitcher plant through an electron microscope, and you can see the complexity of it. What's more interesting is that this internal structure is very well fitted to make a lot of oxygen and secrete it into the water of the pitcher. And this has a very useful effect because in the water of the pitcher are living a lot, a motley crew of little maggots and other insects. Now, what are they doing? Well, it's all very well eating insects, like a pitcher plant does, but a plant doesn't have any teeth, and it's difficult to eat insects if you haven't got teeth. So what the pitcher plant, in effect, does is to borrow the teeth of these maggots in its pitcher. The, what the maggots do is they eat the prey that fall into the pitcher, and then their excretory products are what are finally absorbed by the pitcher plant. So really, the pitcher plant is just getting the same thing as any other plant gets when it, gets, when it eats manure, in effect. But what the pitcher plant is doing is sequestering for itself a private supply of manure by luring insects and by supplying the maggots that live in the pot with a nice oxygen-rich fresh water atmosphere, other, which otherwise they wouldn't like to live in. Here's another sort of pot, a designoid pot. This is made by a trapdoor spider. You can see the trapdoor at the top. The spider lives inside. And another one here. This is the pot of a potter wasp. That's a solitary wasp, not like the social wasps, which build comb more like this honeycomb here. The potter wasp female builds a pot like that out of mud and lays her egg in it, and then the larva grows up inside the pot. Look how beautifully it resembles this designed pot. This is a truly designed pot made by somebody in Mexico. See how similar it is to the pot made by the potter wasp. Yet another animal pot. This was made by a mason bee. Exquisite little thing. It is used for the same purpose as the potter wasp's pot, but it has a different structure. It is just like a house built by humans. These are little individual stones which the bee, the female bee, has gathered and has cemented together to build up this delightful pot structure. And the story doesn't end there because we can only see one pot, but underneath here are four more pots. And they've been carefully covered up by the bee who has gone to the river and gathered clay to cover over her pots. The clay is exactly the same color and texture as the rock on which the pot is placed. So that the bees' predators, the predators who might come and eat larvae out of the pot, uh, would never have, would never know in a million years that there were any pots under there. Here's another beautiful example of designoid architecture. These gigantic megaliths, like Avebury or Stonehenge, are built by the Compass Termite of Australia. They're huge structures, like <coughs> blocks of flats. Certainly in, on termite scale, they are like blocks of flats. They are all pointing exactly north-south, which is another very cunning feature, because that means that they get the morning sun on one side, and they get the evening sun on the other, so they get nicely warmed up in the cool parts of the day. But in the hot part of the day, the midday sun, that hits them end on, and so they don't heat up too much, which is why all these termite nests, they're called compass termites. You can always, when you're in the desert, tell which direction north-south is by looking for a compass termite nest. 
even larger is this other, another kind of termite nest. You can see the scale there. This is a most colossal structure. The uh, Austrian ethologist Karl von Frisch remarked that if humans built structures on the same scale as termites do, then the structures that we would build would be four times as, as high as the Empire State Building. So termites are very, very impressive architects. These designoid objects are very impressive indeed. We're switching now from objects which are apparently designed by animals to the design of animals themselves, the apparent design of animals themselves. And I'm beginning with camouflage. If you were walking through the desert, you would probably think to a casual look that that was a stone. But it's not a stone, uh, it's a grasshopper. It just looks like a stone and it gets protection from looking like a stone. And in the next example, uh, this looks to me exactly like seaweed. It's one of my favorite of all designoid objects. Uh, it is in fact a fish, it's a seahorse. There's its head, there's its neck, there's its body. And these objects sticking out here are part of the fish's body, but anybody would think that they were parts of a seaweed. They look exactly like parts of a seaweed, and the seahorse hides among seaweed of just the right type. It's almost perfectly camouflaged. And we have a few more examples. This is a film of, and you'll see what it is in a moment, it's in fact a leaf insect. There's the shield over the thorax, there's the head, here come the wings, and it, when it isn't moving, perhaps even when it is moving, it looks exactly like leaves. It's just flown off. Here's another look, thing, looks just like a plant, turns out to be a green snake. And this, you would think, was a plant with a bud on the end, a long green stem, more buds. Only when we get to the front end do we just about spot that it has an eye, antennae, and legs. Uh, it is, in fact, a stick insect. Look at these leaves here. Autumn leaves. Look at the vein up the middle of the leaves. Look at the veins on either side. Look at the little splodges of dark colored mold on the leaves. But those are not leaves. Those are butterflies. Look there, you can just see the body there, 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 there. That's what these butterflies look like when they open their wings. This is what they look like on the underside of the wings. And they normally sit with the wings folded so that you only see the underside of the wings and you're very hard put to it to see that they're not dead leaves. Only when they open the wings do you get this flash of brilliant coloration. Camouflaged animals resemble inedible objects, designoid objects sometimes resemble other designoid objects for other reasons, because they're doing the same job. And this is called convergent evolution. This is an ordinary hedgehog. That is nothing whatever to do with a hedgehog, but superficially it looks like it. That is a spiny anteater. It is a mammal, but you might say only just a mammal. It's an egg-laying mammal, a very primitive mammal, from Australia and New Guinea. As a matter of fact, its way of life is not that close to a hedgehog's way of life. Uh, this is an anteater, whereas hedgehogs eat more general things, insects and worms and things. But both of them gain protection from having spiny skins, and so they both superficially look very alike. An example of convergent evolution. An even better example of convergent evolution is the so-called marsupial wolf. Now, if you saw that going along on a lead down the street, you would think it was a dog. A slightly odd sort of dog, perhaps. There aren't many dogs that have quite that structure at the tail end. But you would think that that would not really be out of place at Crufts. But this is not a dog. It has nothing whatever to do with dogs. This is a marsupial. It's much more closely related to kangaroos and wombats and koalas. It's now most unfortunately extinct, only fairly recently extinct. It went extinct this century in Tasmania, went extinct some thousands of years ago on the mainland of Australia. 